All right, let's do it. Let's see here. Welcome to MA Science, where we curate knowledge from the best in MA to continuously improve. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from MA Science, subscribe to our free newsletter at mascience.com. Every week, we share highlights from our interviews, invitations to events, MA role openings, and other resources as we build the greatest community of forward thinking MA practitioners. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of MA Science. Joining me today is Rohit. Dave, Head of Corporate Development at Block. Block, formerly known as Square, is a global technology company with a focus on financial services made up of Square, Cash App, Spiral, Tidal, and TBD. Block builds tools to help more people access the economy. Traded on NYSE under SQ. Today, we're going to talk about executing against different strategies and how to get stakeholder alignment. How's it going, Roy? Hey, Kisan. Glad to be on. Uh, yeah, going really great. It's a nice uh, summer day on the East Coast. I appreciate you taking time out of uh, your day of doing deals to hang out, chat with me a little bit about M&A. Can we kick things off with a little bit about your background? Uh, yeah, sure. Happy to share. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Rohit. I've been on the East Coast most of my life. I went to NYU undergrad and studied finance. Um, we I was a kind of very early adopter of social media. I was really interested in the way the entertainment and media worlds were being disrupted by technology. So out of school, I did some investment banking, but specifically with uh, tech coverage. Uh, following investment banking, I actually went to law school, which is a little bit of a, a backward path for folks who have law degrees and do corporate development. But I was always in, engaged with policy and politics. And so it was something I would really want to do. And uh, being a first-generation American probably uh, added to that appeal. Uh, so while I was in law school, I worked at the technology policy office at the White House for a summer. I worked at venture capital for a couple of different funds. Uh, and that's really when I solidified I wanted to cover technology for the rest of my career. And so out of school, I practiced for a very short period of time before jumping over to corporate development. Uh, my wife and I, we moved to the West Coast. We stayed in the Bay Area, and we I was on the corporate development teams at Samsung. I joined Twilio uh, shortly after it, it IPO'd, which is a you know enterprise software API company. Uh, and then you know after we had our first kid, we decided to move back to the East Coast, and that's when I led a corp dev function for the first time at WeWork. A uh, lot of a lot of stories there, I guess. But uh, I, I you know really two chapters there: a year of executing acquisitions and a year of uh, after the IPO didn't work out, uh, restructuring the business and really executing as divestitures. Uh, after doing all that restructuring, I spent a short amount of time at a venture fund and venture studio in New York called Juxtapose, and that leads me to where I'm now. I've been at Block for about uh, 15 months, running the Corp Dev team here. My my first question that popped in my head was, uh, you, do you prefer living on the West Coast or East Coast? Yeah, I'm, I'm from, I was born in New York. Uh, New York, I think, is the best city in the world. So, uh, I, you know, it's pretty easy for me to say the East Coast, but yeah, I definitely miss wine country in the Bay Area. And uh, uh, yeah, you know, being close to the water and kind of honestly, a little bit more of the work life balance. And MA, you don't always get that. But, uh, you know, there's, a, I think there's a, a healthier kind of uh, balance between the two over there. And uh, we're now, you know, obviously a lot of the stakeholders I work with are, based in Pacific time. So it kind of shifts my day a bit, uh, but you know, uh, I, I, both, both coasts have great things to offer, but I'm a New York uh, city person at art. I, I can understand having the, the bias there being born on the East side or mostly living there. But uh, yeah, I was just curious if this sort of changed your view or not. And then for when going from law, you went straight into corp dev, essentially. You got into M&A, didn't it's sticking to the law side, but went through corp dev roles at Samsung, Twilio, WeWork, and now Block. And that's where it leads us up to this conversation today around the various strategies that you've been executing on those roles. Can we talk about the different types of strategies in M&A? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe even taking half a step back, corporate development has different flavors at different organizations. Um, I know this is the M&A science uh, uh, podcast, so we'll, we'll stick with M&A here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think each, depending on the kind of business you're joining, what stage of their life cycle they are, you'll probably employ different strategies. But I do think broadly, especially in the tech world, they uh, boil down to three different paths, right? There's 
you know, kind of aqua hires, people like to call them, although that means a lot of different things to different people, but really what I would call more talent-led deals, um, which kind of you're accelerating existing roadmaps by uh, by fulfilling a resource constraint in, in talent and making sure you can accelerate hiring and uh, kind of accelerate your plans, call it over the next 12 to 18 months over by a few quarters. Um, there's a, what I call a kind of tuck-in type acquisitions where I really think the main asset you're, the main, the main thing you're acquiring are assets. And I define assets very broadly. Um, assets could be IP, which is how people often think about it, technology. Um, they could be customer lists, customer bases, uh, knowledge and know-how. Uh, you know, you're, uh, it's similar to an Apple hire, maybe a team of people that know how to solve very specific things um, and built kind of a lot of the hard, hard, hard fought learnings over the years. Um, and so it's like a combination of some sort of assets plus some talent. And so, you know, not just accelerating roadmap, you're hope you're probably buying things that you think would be difficult to build or, you know, would be, um, would be too time consuming to build, um, in, in, especially in a more mature market. And then I think the third one are kind of what, when we often think of M&A with what we really think about is, are the strategic deals. Strategic deals are you're buying kind of self-contained operating, fully operating businesses. Um, the strategy there is, you know, maybe you're expanding into a new market, a new geography, maybe you're expanding uh, your product offering. Um, but, you know, by in doing that, you're kind of, it's really the higher leverage, uh, needle moving type transformative acquisition, you know, obviously the more complex one, um, there may be a lot of different considerations, you know, even leaving aside kind of cross border and international type thing considerations, what you're doing there is you're acquiring a full business, right? And there's different, you have their own operating functions, they have different ways of doing things, they have their own culture, and then you have to make a lot of decisions on what the go forward operating model is. Um, and that's, again, I think when we think about M&A, the ones that hit the headlines uh, on the Wall Street Journal, it's usually those types of deals people are talking about. Okay. Uh, I got aquacires, where you're basically buying people. Tuck-ins, where there are things that's either IP tech slash a capability or customers that, that's leading that acquisition. And then a strategic, where you're buying a full operating business. Um, and I, when you break those three down, it sounds like there's different size categories that if you compare it to the overall business balance sheet, NACO hire is probably the smallest side, and then it goes up with the tuck in and then more on the strategic side. Is that how you yeah. look at that? Is there sort of like a kind of like yeah. a budget view? Like, hey, we could do, you know, how do you look at that? Uh, yeah, I know there. That's that's a fair point. Right. And I, I do think that's how often the business thinks about it. Uh, you know, this is a smaller deal. It's a tuck in. This is a talent deal. Um, you know, I think this, you know, usually your CFO will kind of have different, you know, different considerations that they have. Uh, if your CFO has a budget or envelope for a year for M&A, then they probably are thinking, well, that means probably X number of the first type, you know, Y number of the second type, et cetera. Um, it's probably broadly right, right? The acquires, the talent deals tend to be smaller. The tuck ins tend to be kind of more in that middle category. Uh, and then the strategic ones tend to be a little bit bigger. Um, and part of that is informed by the fact that, you know, if, if you see eye to eye with the target and what purpose this is fulfilling, um, that your valuation is going to reflect that. What I mean by that is if I am valuing the talent versus I'm valuing assets plus talent versus I am valuing your entire business, um, the purchase price will be reflected in that. It's all relative, right? Like if, uh, depending on the size of the company, an acquirer could be, you know, if, if you're, if as the acquirer, you're a massive multi-billion dollar business versus you're, you know, a privately funded unicorn, um, those, uh, a strategic deal might look a lot different to you than a strategic deal does to Apple, for instance. So um, it's, it's all relative, but I, yeah, I agree generally speaking, right? There's kind of the smaller size deals, the bigger, medium size, the bigger ones. Um, you would probably, you know, I, I, you would probably see there are some deals, especially if you think about it from the outside, that may actually, especially in the first two buckets, blur a lot more. You know, the talent deals plus like the tuck in and you know tuck in asset plus talent deals, they can kind of kind of blur. Um, and you know, there might be deals from the outside. I think sometimes that look like strategic or more tuck in type deals, but then they're actually really just expensive apple hires, especially in this last macro cycle we saw, uh, where the valuations were getting pretty frothy. Um, you know, you really were acquiring a team of people that knew how to do things and they hadn't really 
maybe achieve product market fit or, you know, we're even for maybe pre-revenue at times. And so that's very much a talent deal, but just maybe you paid more for it because that's what was needed to get the deal done. Um, and then similarly, you know, you might, you might acquire a, a business that's primarily you're acquiring some technology, you know, maybe there's a, an existing customer base, but it's relatively small, not needle moving. And you might characterize it and kind of see it from that tuck in lens and that'll inform structure and valuation. But, you know, they, those can also be complex, right? And going back to one of the things I mentioned, if it's cross-border, if it's a company in, I don't know, let's say today it was in Russia, uh, I, I, th I think that would be pretty complex, even though it's like a smaller you know, check size. Going back to the earlier point you made around some of this stuff is relative to the stage or life cycle that the company's at. So even for yourself, getting into this head of corp dev role, but assessing that against the life stage that these different companies are at, would that shift around what type of strategy they're primarily focused on? Like maybe earlier stage is more focused on those aqua hires and later they're doing the strategics or does it not impact that at all? Yeah, I, you, you mean as the acquirer, right? Correct. Yeah, um, it should. I, I mean, I, I think there's a few considerations there. Uh, it does just empirically has to, right? If you're a smaller, uh, company and especially for a private company, uh, you have less currency by which to do MA. What I mean by that is you probably can't use your venture investors cash to go get acquisitions done. Maybe you can, maybe that was part of your fundraise, but you have a limited uh, you know, dry powder to go acquire those types uh, to make acquisitions. So you're using your own stock. Your private stock, uh, you know, your target may not see it the same way. Uh, you know, like they may have a different perspective on the valuation. Again, we've, we're kind of in a different economic climate now too, and a different, uh, you know, markets have shifted. And so the last round at which you raised uh, capital, the valuation at which you raised may not reflect like what the target sees as the value of your stock today. And so it's harder, it's just harder to get those, get deals done. And so um, you are, you are probably looking at a smaller set of companies that would even entertain an acquisition conversation. Um, and there's companies will probably tend to be smaller. Uh, they themselves may be like smaller startups. Uh, and so just by virtue of the fact that they're smaller, maybe earlier stage themselves, these targets, they will probably more often than not fit into this talent or kind of tuck in type category, um, right? They may not have full fledged operations. They may just have a product that launched. They may be pre-revenue. And so they, by virtue of like kind of limited opportunities that you have as the acquirer, the companies you're looking at fall into those first two buckets. You know, the, the other thing is if you're an earlier stage acquirer yourself, growth stage acquirer, you know, especially again, if you're private or even if, you know, you're public, but you just, you know, there's a lot of companies that went public over the last couple of years and, you know, are kind of sitting at sub billion dollar market caps and they have the currency, they have stock to acquire with, but then it could be highly diluted. Even if you're, if you're in one of those, if you are an acquirer that with those uh, traits, um, even if you have more of an opportunity set, you may not want to acquire the more strategic businesses because um, they're more mature, potentially you yourself are likely in a more high growth emerging uh, space. So there's going to be a drag on your growth. Likely if you're acquiring the more mature business, um, it might help you on a margin basis, but you yourself are probably being valued more on growth than margin. And so well, are you willing to trade growth, like uh, you know, a drag on your growth or slower growth business for margin at that stage? Maybe not. It, it depends on what you're optimizing for from a financial perspective. Cultures would may clash. That acquisition might be a lot more difficult. Um, uh, you know, if there's a one of the things about acquiring a fully operating business is they have their own set of culture. Um, they have their own people philosophies. Um, they have their own mission, uh, and they've executed against it. And so, when you're bringing those types of companies into your earlier stage, likely more chaotic, high growth culture, is that going to be a fit? Um, I think because of those reasons, like you tend to, when you're at an earlier stage, look at other businesses that are in their growth or early stage. And so by virtue of that, you're often looking at more of that aqua hire and tuck in type um, acquisition. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, is, again, especially in this past cycle and I think continuously the case today, the engineering, uh, when you think about talent, you're often thinking about engineering talent, right? Or some sort of specialized talent in a space that you know, it's maybe highly regulated. Um, there's there's things, there's like a knowledge set that is coveted and scarce in the market from a labor perspective. And so uh, if you're an earlier stage business, 
uh, you may cut, you know, one of your, one of, if you're, if your unit economics are good, uh, one of the, the biggest constraints to you executing as your plan is people. And so that's when a lot of times companies turn to aqua hires, right? And so you can see a growth stage business probably having to resort to that more often. Um, and, you know, I don't know, uh, this is maybe a separate topic, but, and I don't know if companies should think about things this way, but a lot of times, you know, the aqua hires allow you to potentially get higher, uh, potentially let you get some more uh, uh, premium elite talent that otherwise you wouldn't be able to go higher in the labor market. And so uh, when you make, so when you think about M&A from that perspective, you're an early stage business comparing, you know, trying to go into the market and hire the same people that, you know, the FANG businesses are giving out much more lucrative offers to, uh, you know, M&A might be a way to kind of bridge that gap to go fire a bit, to go acquire a bunch of talent altogether that would be harder to pick off one at a time in the labor market. So for those reasons, I think it is, I think growth stage businesses do tend to look at more of the first two. Um, not to say, you know, it doesn't always, doesn't make sense to look at the strategic ones. A lot of times the strategic ones can look more like, um, you know, merger of equal type scenarios or, you know, business or acquisitions where you're giving up a significant percentage of your business to, to kind of, and the reason you might do that is, you know, you see that there's just a bigger market opportunity or there's value to accelerating, you know, um, the different things you thought your components you were going to build, the platform you thought you were going to build because, you know, incumbents are catching up or, you know, there the market opportunities, there's like a small window and you, the best way to capitalize against it is to, even though it's dilutive, to go acquire, uh, to go merge with uh, one of your peers. It's a lot of different ways you can look at what drives doing the deals and then also economic factor as you grow you got more options essentially yeah i i think i think that's right um and as you grow you know it's both it's both uh you know it's like a two two-edged sword right um yeah you have more current you, you know as you grow you may go public you might have public company currency you may have a better cash position on your balance sheet to go do acquisitions and the other side of that, of course, is maybe, you know, some of the the initial, maybe some of the earlier growth opportunities aren't, you know, are diminishing. Maybe the, you know, there's diminishing returns on growth, or, you know, there's a, you're starting to plateau on where you can get from terms of margin expansion. And so, you have to think a little more creatively about what, how do you think about your next chapter? How do you think about kind of the next, uh, you know, inflection points in your business? And that's when sometimes, you know, a, an aqua hire or a tuck in doesn't move the needle quite as much. You know, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a larger company, uh, you know, acquiring a team of 10 people to go build out X product, that's probably gonna take three to four years to ramp is not really going to move your needle for your business or for your shareholders uh, in, you know, in the time scale that they expect. And so that's when, yeah, you have to, you both have the benefit of having the, probably the financial position to go think about the more strategic opportunities. But then you also, you're also, you're also looking at the strategic opportunities because you maybe, you know, some of the internal organic opportunities are starting to flatten out. If you to click down and really identify what strategy to use, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, that's a good question because yeah, none of these things exist in a vacuum, right? I mean, I think the worst case scenario is you start acquiring things because you're reacting to opportunities being presented to you. Um, you know, M and A, um, as I'm sure many other folks who come on here have said, it really doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, you know, you're going, you're thinking about M and A as kind of a, a tool and yet another tool to go accomplish your business needs. And so, you know, the very first question is, what is the business need? What is the problem statement? Um, and, you know, typically, right, uh, you think about build, buying and partnering, but let's say, let's say it is buying, then, you know, I think under aligning on what the right North stars are um, is really important. Um, you know, starting with me with kind of a more abstracted, higher level North star, what, it, what are you looking to solve? Are you trying to solve an engineering problem that you are having, you know, having trouble staffing against, and it's really about accelerating a few quarters? Are you trying to acquire something? Are you trying to um, build an asset that's going to be very difficult? You know, there's kind of very specialized knowledge to build it, or you know, there's 
you know, certain licenses you need and those are very scarce. Like, is there something like an asset you need in order to go, uh, go kind of hit this next growth vector or go, you know, build this next product? Um, are you, you know, are you basically saying, uh, you know, I, I like the economics of this other business and this other product uh, or industry. And it's kind of obvious we need to expand into that. And I want to do that over, you know, some sort of horizon, but there's a lot of uncertainty and risk there and an acquisition can kind of help you risk that. I think aligning on what you're trying to accomplish from a business need is really critical to then try to decide what kind to then kind of figure out what is the type of acquisition. I mean, you know, I, an example, maybe, you know, if uh, you want to go, you know, you feel like you need to go uh, expand on, um, you know, your, you're, you have a you have a product and you want to go extend the product, right? Um, is it is that product mature today? Uh, is it something emerging? Do I have time to actually build it? It's just a question more just I don't have the talent and the people to and the person power to go put this thing into the world. Or is it more the, the industry is mature? And if we don't have this product, we're actually going to churn customers. Um, you know, on the former, if it's emerging and there's time to go build it, but it's just, it could be a competitive advantage, it's more offensive strategy if we can build it first. And there's not a lot of things in the market that actually look like what I want to build, the experience I'd want to present, offer to the world. And then aqua hire starts to make sense, right? Like we know that the North Star is, I want to accelerate the development of this product that we want to grow in-house. If on the other hand, it's, I don't care as much about this product itself, but without this product, my existing customer base is going to start to churn. Um, and it's a mature space. By the time I build that thing, it's going to be years. And so the churn problem is already going to happen. So if I identified, hey, churn's the issue, uh, I want to re retain my customers, then that kind of tells you, okay, so this is not an aqua hire type situation. It's probably either an asset I need to acquire and build around it, or I need to go acquire the strategic business. And then, you know, that's when there's a little bit of give and take. You'll go meet some companies. You'll try to understand the landscape. You'll see the ones that, you know, it's more than just looking at, you know, numbers on an income statement, right? Or, you know, a projection model. You're, you'll have to go and see, is that company a fit? Like, are they culture going to mesh? Are they, you know, again, again, going back to timelines, when does this have to happen? Um, if, I, if, if the answer is yesterday, we should have built this two years ago and we're just really behind. You might, don't need, you might need to go acquire that strategic uh, business. If in the other hand, you're still, you know, it's still kind of, it's not emerging, but it's still kind of early, early few years into this um, product category. And yeah, maybe you can build and buy, maybe the nice mix for you there would be to buy the asset. Uh, buy the asset and a small team around it. You can hire around it. You can kind of have better control over the culture over time. Um, you can have a tighter control over what the product looks like over time. You know, maybe, maybe you had that, that window to think about those things. What about if you are a company that has great product solutions, but wants to expand on the distribution? I'm, I'm curious if that's, hey, ideally you're supposed to build out your go-to-market organically and then get your VP of sales. Or is have you seen situations where through an acquisition they've been able to accelerate the distribution goals to be able to reach the products to the customers? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I, I I think it goes. I, I think it can go either way. Um, it it depends, right? Like I do think sometimes you're acquiring distribution. Um, you know, there's. I guess some examples I can't talk about today, but there, there are there are examples where you know you have I mean, science is a safe space. You just don't drop names <laughs> and dates, and you can tell anything you want. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll tread carefully there, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, there are definitely times when you realize, you know, your go to market for some customer base, especially, you know, sometimes, especially if you're thinking about like channel relationships, isn't working and, or, you know, maybe working, but it's not giving you the ROI you expect. And then you see some other company is, is executing against that strategy really well. Now, I, I think it's pretty rare that you would go acquire a business strictly for their go to market. Um, again, and I think there's a distinction here between B2B and consumer. So maybe let's start with B2B and then go to consumer. On, on B2B, uh, it's pretty unlikely that you're just going to go, you know, acquire a business for their sales team alone uh, or their, you know, their market strategy alone and their product has no, it's expensive. Um, so uh, salespeople often are 
actually easier to hire in market. Um, it's, you know, there's, there, there's, there's a question of compensation a lot of times. Um, the product, if the product's not a fit, what are you, so, you know, what are you doing? You're going to throw that all out to try to just win this one channel over. Um, the, sale, the sales strategy may not work for your product, right? And so it only makes sense in that instance if you actually think the product category is one you want to expand it to two. And probably more importantly than that, that there's cross-selling uh, potential. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, Tw Twilio acquired SendGrid, right? Twilio is an API business uh, built around uh, communications, messaging, voice, um, kind of has, you know, combined a lot of those uh, different APIs into uh, more robust use cases, like around the contact center and um, customer engagement. And then SendGrid, uh, you know, was a set of email APIs. And so did all a number of those other things too, in terms of like the use cases, but specifically around email. You know, SendGrid uh, had a slightly more upmarket customer base. Uh, you know, they, they while there was like a lot of overlap over customer base, email is a more mature product. And so there was a lot more enterprise using it. Um, they also had, and this is what's relevant, they also had distribution through kind of marketing automation platforms. Like they were the API used by a bunch of marketing automation platforms. Um, you know, I don't think it was any execution issue by Twilio that didn't allow for, you know, the Twilio APIs to be on marketing automation platforms, but marketing automation platforms like marketers were still using email, right? It was just like, there was, a, there was still like a slow lag in terms of the channel shift. Now you could have a thesis there where um, you know, having access that in those inroads to marketing automation platforms, and then not just the platforms themselves, but the end user marketers, right? That customer persona, having good mind share with them, uh, makes maybe makes sense for an acquisition, you know, where you can justify an acquisition. But, you know, in a world in which you don't think there's cross attach between the email product and the messaging and voice product, that's, yeah, it's expensive. Exactly what you said. Are you really going to spend that kind of money to try to have make inroads to marketing automation platform and try to acquire this customer persona that may or may not find any, um, in, or may not may or may not be interested in your product? It only works if you think your product can attach with the with the target's product. So, you know, I think, I think distribution is a part and parcel of those types of strategies, but it's going to be rare, at least in the world I'm in, right, with software and uh, tech that it's going to be the reason to make an acquisition. Now, I don't know, maybe in manufacturing, uh, that that's a different story uh, potentially, but in the world I'm in, it doesn't really make a ton of sense. I would say, um, on the consumer side though, I didn't make a distinction and the consumer side, it tends to uh, have a little bit more complexity, I'd say, right. In that, um, you know, maybe there is a user demographic that your product hasn't resonated to resonated with to date. But is that a is that a byproduct of your product? Maybe, or is that by virtue of the fact that you employed a very successful marketing campaign toward a certain demographic and not toward others? If you have kind of a similar product set to a target business, but they've just been more successful at acquiring a different demographic, a consumer demographic from you, um, you know, there's probably some math there around per user. Um, you know, revenue per user uh, that could make sense for you or some lifetime value calculation if their demographic's a little bit more attractive. Um, I think businesses, uh, you know, I think on the B2B side, it's just a little more nuanced and complex around the product that the customer's buying from you. On the consumer side, sometimes it may be a very similar product um, and the ability to then use that to, to then think about acquisition as a way to maybe move a little bit more up market um is interesting uh but again the math needs to work it may still be an expensive proposition depending on the target's expectations that's why i like e-commerce at least the math somewhat makes sense there as opposed to other industries I, yeah uh, yeah <laughs> on um can we talk about chasing shiny things because they we, sure. we talked about having this north star strategy and then that should guide you on the companies you're buying. But I don't think that really happens. And I'm curious, I think this sparked the initial conversation when we first met around, hey, you did some interesting deals at WeWork specifically. They didn't get the best press in terms of all these acquisitions we're yeah. doing. You know, how does this align with what they do? But then it depends on how you look at it. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm curious about that. You know, is it strictly on the view of here's your North Star and got, let that guide you to the opportunities or the shiny things that pop up and then building the justification how it would fit the strategy? Where does the line fit between? Come on, you know, you know it's more art than science, they say, right? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I'd say, I hope the answer is more like it's in between, right? It's craft. Um, and yeah, I think shiny object syndrome is a very real thing. Uh, I'm not going to pretend like it's not. Uh, you know, I think it depends on your company's culture and how executives make decisions for sure. You know, you reference WeWork. I think, uh, you know, that definitely plays a part. Um, maybe to take a half a step back, uh, like I think there's kind of deals are generated from really three ways, right? And so one of them is, I think the best way is kind of bottoms up proactive a deal, deal kind of generation, right? You're, you understand your business partner's needs. You've identified folks, um, not just at the executive level, but within the business, what do we want to call it? Working group plus one, plus two away from the executive team uh, with that, that you, ha you understand, you know, you understand what their objectives are. You recognize what their roadmap is and the needs and gaps. And so you're, this is the best type of deal making. You are then actively going and understanding what's going on in the market. There's a dialogue, there's a pitter patter there. You have conversations around what what might make sense to build versus buy or partner, right? And then over time, you kind of come up with the view. And then when you do identify those gaps, like from a first principles basis uh, that you want to acquire rather than build for you know all the factors that you would acquire versus build, uh, you know, the corp dev team is then going out and finding opportunities to fit in that. And then you have to build consensus kind of bottoms up, right? Then you go to their manager, you go to their executive, then you go to the whole C-suite, then you go to the board. That's the best type of deal making because you know it's something, in my opinion, because you, you know it's something that the business needs that you both kind of collaborated on to understand both from a financial perspective and like a balance sheet perspective, being a steward of your capital, does this make sense? But then also from a product perspective, does this team have the right culture? Are they going to accelerate my roadmap and plans? Or are they going to be a distraction? Um, uh, you know, you, you, it's, you marry those two things and you can build really strong consensus and then go after that acquisition. There's another kind I'd say that's a little more inbound, right? Um, historically, we think about this as investment bankers, but over like kind of the last decade, it's also venture investors, you know, PEs, growth equity shops that are calling you, you're building relationships with them. A lot of these front funds have built like portfolio managers or platform teams that actually part of their part of their job is to reach out to people like me and build cultivate those relationships because, you know, they understand this space is very well. They have to build really high conviction, these investors uh, over like 10 year arcs. And so, you know, they know what's out there. Um, and so they provide you leverage. And so you learn from them, they give you inbounds. And so similar to bankers giving you inbounds, um, but you know, there's there's differing interests and incentives and why they're reaching out to you. So you still have to do your own work to figure out if it makes sense. Um, those are usually lower likelihood, I feel like, of going forward, but still important conversations. Um, sometimes they can bring a new perspective. Um, there is sometimes shiny object syndrome with that as well uh because you know uh if some company that's gotten a lot of great press uh comes to your doorstep it's like you know because of the visibility you bring it you bring it internally you socialize it people get excited oh this company's for sale let me go learn some more um but i think ultimately you know if you're talking about that working group level that plus one plus two away from executive teams there's only so much they can chase the shiny object they still need buy-in from from their kind of seniors yeah. right and so usually, you know, you, you'll kind of get to a very princ principled outcome. And then actually, I would say it's probably corp dev's job if the outcome is wrong, like if you're saying no to something that actually makes sense economically to then kind of help them think differently, build a case and maybe build consensus. The, I think the shiny object syndrome comes the most sometimes with the third category, which is uh, when, when things tend to be a little more top down. Um, these are the more transformative acquisitions. Usually they're the ones where, you know, like you have somebody from the C-suite saying like, this is a company that, you know, from just like from a concept perspective, but conceptually, this is a space we need to be in. This company understands something we don't. Um, they've built something we haven't. Um, you know, the, the marriage of our brands will be amazing. This will be, you know, an accelerant to our plans and vision for the, you know, especially vision, right? Like you think about these bigger sizable shiny objects, like this thing's going to accelerate my five-year plan but the how isn't always there in that, right? And that's where it's, you get enamored by the shiny object, but you haven't really figured out if, if the business is what you think it is. Uh, you know, you kind of already have come to a view before you've actually done the analysis. Uh, 
and it's hard to shake that sometimes, right? Uh, <laughs> and so sometimes you're fortunate. Sometimes you know that the that sometimes the shiny object and numbers and everything kind of just makes sense, right? Like there's the synergies are credible. Um, the customer base, you know, the overlap and the extension of the customer base makes sense. You know, the products do cross attach. Um, you know, cultures are a great fit. But as you can tell, there's a lot of boxes to check. So it's it's not uh, it's not a foregone conclusion. But a lot of times, to your point, you know, if there's like a lot of conviction around how this company, you know, a plus a one plus one can get you to three over a five year arc, you're trying to back into okay, it doesn't make sense in year one. It doesn't make sense in year two. Maybe maybe the two things kind of work together and get you to where you want in year five. Um, and that's where I think what you're talking about happens sometimes. It's like this idea that this, you know, I don't know how to get from my year one plan to my five-year vision. I want to get there. I think there's a bunch of paths to get there. And this acquisition maybe can be that silver bullet. And so I get them enamored by that shiny object. Um, you know, the other reality is like sometimes from the outside, things look a lot better than they are when you get inside, right? And so, um, you know, I, you as Corp Dev, your job is to provide hopefully as objective a view as possible. Um, at some point, you know, the old Amazon thing, you have to disagree and commit, but, but hopefully these are at the 50-50 cases that you get there, right? Like when you, when you get to a point where it's a 50-50 or coin toss and an executive makes a call, um, then, you know, you disagree, commit and execute against that. But if, if it's pretty glaringly clear, like this is not a 50, 50 toss up, this is something where, you know, this can be value destructive to our business. You have to, you have to raise your voice and try to find a way or not really raise your voice. You have to find a way to make your voice be heard. Um, and that's the way you try to try to overcome the shiny object syndrome. Um, but again, I, you know, it's exciting, right? As an MA professional, you're trying to do the more impactful business deals. Like those are the ones that you that make you do what you do, right? That's the reason we get out of bed. You're hoping to find that needle moving thing. Um, so you have to find the right balance. Uh, it's exciting when there's that shiny object or like the C-suite, that top-down deal comes and it's shiny. It's exciting. Um, and so initially you kind of go in with, I, mean, I do anyway, with some sense of optimism, but then that optimism has to be weighed by, you know, a healthy dose of cynicism and pragmatism. Uh, because it's going to be ultimately you that can't, you can't have the rose colored glasses on and you're going to have to present um, whether or not the deal makes sense or doesn't. And again, if it gets to 50, 50 toss up, disagree, commit the C-suite will govern. But if it's glaringly a bad deal, you got to find a way to make that clear. You done deal that you don't want to do? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I have. Uh, uh, how, how does uh, that yeah. go down? Do you just say, hey, go, you know, commit, and that's commit, disagree, commit, whatnot. Uh, but then uh, yeah, how does that pan out? Do you just, hey, I do what I got to do? And is there things that get lost in terms of that sense of passion yeah. drive to make sure the deal is successful? I think the thing to remember is there are multiple stages and checkpoints as you go through a deal process. Um, you know, just, and every company's different, but, you know, at minimum, you're going to have some sort of check-in with some C-suite person, depending on the size of your business or your, the way you kind of think about approvals, maybe all the C-suite, um, before you put out like some sort of non-binding offer, right? Whether it's an LOI, IOI, term sheet, depending on the weight of it, depending on kind of your own reputation around M&A and how you think about, you know, uh, that stage, how serious you are about that stage, how much work you get done at least one C-suite person is probably going to have a say in that and very often multiple. Um, and then you're also going to have a check-in at the, you know, the diligence, like after your diligence, like confirmatory type diligence is done before you sign definitive agreements, there's going to be some sort of approval or, you know, check-in that happens there. Um, on most, you know, maybe except for very smaller deals, but you know, pretty much that's how it's going to work. And, and depending on the type of deal, especially on the more transformative ones, it's going to be a lot more common than that. You might have a weekly check-in, right? You might you might have, you know, once it really gets into it toward the end as you're wrapping up diligence and you have to come to a decision, if it's, especially if it's a public-to-public -public deal, you might be having daily conversations around it. And so I think the thing to remember is keep doing the work, keep learning, um, and keep surfacing and escalating the flags. Um, why, you know, there's there's... Really, I mean, there's probably many reasons why you wouldn't do a deal, but like in my, like as far as how I categorize it, really two types of two reasons not to, from S Corp that person I wouldn't want to do a deal, right? One is I disagree with the strategy. You know, maybe 
you know, there's a lot of assumptions. If I tweak them in the more upside case, uh, it might make sense. But I don't agree that the assumptions and drivers should be in that upside case. I actually believe the numbers are going to go the other way. That's fine. That's where I can get to the disagree and commit, right? Because maybe you as the executive have done this longer, you know more, maybe you know the space better. Maybe you're more in the weeds, you know the customer more, maybe. There's there's enough that we're honest and you know people with integrity and intelligence to disagree on what the right assumptions and drivers are, which way the assumptions will turn. And it's really a question of the deal could succeed if all these assumptions pan out, the deal could not succeed if I'm right and all these assumptions don't pan out. But in those instances, yeah, smart people can disagree, it makes sense. Um, the, the problem, if you move forward on a deal uh, that unfortunately has, it's less about the assumptions and more about like real like red flags, like tangible empirical things today exist that will be value destructive or that will be distracting or, you know, at minimum make you want to have to revisit the purchase price in a meaningful way. And then you keep moving forward on those deals because of, you know, shiny object syndrome, inertia, uh, whatever, the, maybe there's, you know, and bigger, fortunately, not most of the places that work, but bigger organizations, there's some like po internal political risk and CYA, like, I don't want to have to be seen as having, you know, committed all these resources to diligence this thing and then being wrong, which would be, you know, the worst reason to do a deal. But, you know, it's when you start seeing these flags that are more than just kind of assumptions where you can disagree, but clear indicators that some of the assumptions are just wrong. Um, I don't know, a compliance issue. Uh, that could lead to, you know, investigations from a regulatory agency, um, fraud, hopefully you don't move forward on a deal where you see fraud, uh, you know, uh, some intangible things gut feel like the C-suite, I cannot trust them. Um, you know, they lied to, or maybe even smaller things that could, or, or, you know, by a thousand cuts kill you. Um, they lied about where this product was, what stage this was in. They lied about the product market here. They lied about, you know, or they fudged, you know, the, their retention numbers. Like every, you know, but if there's like a thousand of those things, it starts becoming a yellow, orange, red flag. In those instances, you're just always trying to present information. And the ones where, uh, you know, which I both have disagreed on the first set, you know, where the strategy just doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, like I said, smart people can disagree. And plus I keep finding these orange flags. You're just finding whatever form and channel makes sense to continue elevating them. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is it also depends on who's sponsoring the deal, right? Like if it's, if it's the, you know, if it's like a chief product officer, they still need probably the CEO and CFOs buy in. If it's, you know, if it's someone, somebody else, like a GM of a business, they probably need some, one of their seniors buy-ins and they need C-suites buy-in. It becomes, starts becoming tougher when the CEO and CFO have locked arms together and said, we want to go do this deal. That's when it starts becoming tougher. Um, and, and, yeah, uh, I, I won't share. <laughs> I, I'll stay silent on whether I've done deals in those instances. <laughs> but like, um, uh, yeah, like it, it, in those instances, it's hard to overcome it. And you have to recognize that, but it's still your job to continue surfacing um, the problem areas. Uh, and so thankfully, yeah. the, among the deals I've done that I didn't want to do, most of them have been in that first category, not all of them. Um, there have definitely been instances where I've tried to, you know, continue, continue as a team to flag the issues. Um, but, you know, depending on who the stakeholders are, they're trying to move it forward. You may or may not be able to convince them. So how many times have you acquired a business and then in turn divested the business? Well, that, that comes down to one company I've worked at. That's, well, no, that's not Obviously true. there's a big prime example. Yeah. 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 No, that's not true. Actually, you know, there's uh, at least one other example I had other than uh, working at WeWork. Um, yeah. Look at WeWork. Uh, while I was there, we acquired uh, numbers or I'm a little, I'm a little off on the numbers now probably, but like somewhere between 10, 11, 12 businesses over the course of like a 10 or 11 span, month span. Um, a number of these acquisitions predated me. Uh, <laughs> I often get asked about the wave pool. Uh, so that was not mine. Um, but, you know, uh, of the acquisitions we made, you know, they ranged, right? They were like aqua hires of like five to 10 people to, you know, larger, more strategic uh, acquisitions. And um, yeah, probably ended up having to divest half uh, half of them. So it was, uh, well, no, about a third of the ones I had acquired and then a couple of the ones that predated me. So yeah, that was uh, that was one of the shortest turnarounds probably in the history of M&A where you acquire stuff, you're acquiring things and spinning them out. We're kind of seeing some of that again in the crypto world right now, actually. But um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a really quick 180 from acquiring to divesting.
I've done it, you know, it may be more relevant here because um, those that was circumstances. I still stand by a couple of the acquisitions we made and I think the thesis is actually playing out. You see, you know, kind of the business we sold were to private equity and they've rolled up basically a strategy, of, you know, especially in the, in the software, the real estate software space. They've rolled up businesses that did exactly what we acquired, you know, the targets we acquired. And now they've combined a bunch of them and you see them now maybe, uh, you know, building pretty sizable businesses on their own. Um, so, you know, I, I think those are hard to know. We don't know how they would have played out. Some of them probably for the best that were immediately divested. I think on the, um, you know, I, at least one example where I had divested the business that we acquired uh, after like, you know, a couple of years. Yeah, those are tough, right? But you have to always, you know, as a finance professional, you know, you can't, um, you know, you, you don't, you know, you want to be beholden to some costs. And those are tough because, you know, you make these acquisitions with hopefully really high conviction. Um, you make acquisitions that are other than maybe on the talent side, deals that are two, three, four, five year arcs to play out, right? And so to be find out you're wrong uh, two years later, or you think you're wrong because either the market has changed and so your assumptions were so off, or the business just isn't what you hoped it would be, the leadership isn't what you hoped it would be, you were bad at integrating. Uh, that's you know, it's not always the other side, it's the YouTube sometimes. Um, then those are really tough conversations because you're having to revisit all these assumptions you had you had to build real a lot of conviction around and it makes you kind of question your strategy and like it's it's uncomfortable um but you have to have those series of conversations and often what i found in these situations is you almost bargain you're almost figuring out like what else could i do with this asset when you know the answer is probably divested you're kind of thinking oh is there like something you know is there something more creative we can do can we spin this into a joint venture? Can we repurpose it to do X, Y, Z? And you realize, well, um, by the time you've burned all the money to try to explore those other things, it's just going to become an even bigger and costlier mistake. So then you should probably go consider, at least understand if it's a divestiture or a carve out is a, a viable in the market. Can you teach me how to get buy-in from CEO and board? Yeah, I think it's two parts. It's, it's data and then storytelling. You, you can't, I mean, it's pretty unlikely if you work at a good company and you have good decision makers, it's pretty unlikely that they're going to make decisions that are abjectly uh, against what the data is telling you. Um, you know, if you project out the business, you look at the unit economics and it turns out it's just going to continue. It's going to burn more and more money over time. There isn't really a path to break even. It's it's not impossible, but it's very unlikely you're going to have an executive still say, "Well, I still want to go do that because I think I can." You know, I I have, I, I you know I I am the master of the universe. I can go turn this business around and combine that with my business and the synergies. We're going to get it to break even. Um, so like it's hard. It's hard to. It's unlikely that you're going to present. Uh, data, whether it's in the go case or in the no go case, that um, is then you're going to have a decision maker just squarely contradict it. Um, but like, I do think even with data is not sufficient, right? Um, you need to tell stories, you need to tell good narratives. And I don't mean fabricate things, but you have to kind of paint the picture. I don't know, I'm mixing metaphors, but storytelling and picture painting. Um, you need to explain like how this is going to, you know, why, why these synergies are going to happen. Why is it important that these synergies happen? What does it do for our market position? How does it get us closer to that five-year vision? Um, what it does, what does the business do that we don't do today? Uh, and like, why together are we going to go, you know, accomplish this thing, you know, going back to mission, mission statements, vision, values, values and culture. I think those pieces, are sometimes overlooked by corporate professionals because we're trained we're trained as lawyers and bankers and you know private equity and you know, you're kind of looking at numbers all day long uh, or the contracts all day long and negotiating and so you forget sometimes like the that ultimately it's people and cultures that are meshing right and it's the ability to work together against a certain problem statement and a certain mission is what's going to make an acquisition successful or not and so in addition to the numbers and information that you're presenting or mostly around financials um, but, you know, it's other operational metrics too. You need to tell a story on why this matters and how it gets you to the vision. 
Um, and I think just as important as part telling that story is trying to bring executives along on that story. So, you know, I think, and I've learned this mistake a few times in my career, it, you know, it's, it's harder to tell the compelling, compelling story to a receptive audience. If you tell them one time in that one meeting where you're going to present it for the first time, you need to start kind of painting that picture earlier on. You need to, you need to bring it, you know, like kind of preview it. You need to share with the CSP, like, this is something we're looking at. Wow, this opportunity is amazing. Maybe there's like piecemeal content strategy, right? Maybe it's, this is an opportunity where a market we're evaluating with the product team. Um, here's like a little uh, readout on that. Um, you know, we're share some market developments. This, this, and this has changed. So a lot of the, our operating assumptions from two years ago are now different. So kind of like a build up before you finally get to those last couple of meetings where you're going to make a decision on whether or not you're going or go, it's a go or no go on the acquisition. Cause if the first time somebody's hearing about it, even if you tell the best story, you know, if it's uh, you know, if it's, if it's the Godfather, you know, <laughs> you're presenting the Godfather in that meeting, probably gonna be harder to get them to pay attention. And not only is it gonna be hard to get them to pay attention, they're gonna interrupt you and ask you a bunch of different questions. That's gonna totally violate your ability to tell a narrative. So it's only if you've kind of warmed them up a lot, brought them along the way that you're going to be able to actually have success when you do that storytelling and present that information when you're looking for a decision. I like where you're going with this. Do you have a hard stop on the hour, by the way? Can I keep you for an extra five, 10 minutes? Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm probably good. Yeah, I'll double check my calendar. Yeah, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, I sort of want to hold up for you know the billion dollar deals you might be working on. I, uh, <laughs> No comment. Hey, I, I, I wanted, well, the story stuff's interesting. Can, can we break that down into an example? Because I think this is the thing I'm a craft. I'm really trying to get good at, and it, it is bringing that in. And like you said, I like how you built it, that it, you repeat it and it, it sort of becomes stickier or even like you kind of slice the different formats of it. Um, yeah. How do, how do you like, can you give me an example of how you would shape that? Here's a sort of deal. You're building the business case around it, but being able to, tell that in a story that lands well. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and again, this is the reason sometimes you'll know a company for a few years before you end up moving forward on an acquisition. It's not just getting to know the other sides because internally you're also having to build that story. And, you know, there's also the element that you know, people are moving seats internally and sometimes the right person's not in the seat for you to move forward on something. Um, yeah. An example, look, I, there is a, there's a product uh, category when you know I was at Twilio that uh, one of the product the GMs, one of the product leads, was really adamant about. It was about uh, kind of building a more modular context center, not just providing the APIs that could let somebody rip and replace and build their own context center themselves, but more about kind of going one level up and creating modules um, and even user interfaces because Twilio is you know an API business that had some products with the user interface, but not a lot. The building a little bit more that it made made it easier for the customers to piece together how they could use Twilio to build their own contact center rather than just kind of the most, you know, um, savvy engineering focused organization being able to do it. Like anybody could do it. And it, this was like a vision the person had for a few years. So like not a, you know, it wasn't like a corp dev driven thing per se. Um, and so, you know, when, he started finally getting some buy-in and funding to go experiment and build portions of it. You know, it became pretty clear, like when we would talk about it, that there were there were really big gaps that we would never build, especially if the idea was to try to you know get something to customers' hands uh, sooner than later. And so, you know, we started we started you know what probably ended up being like a almost like you know like a, over a year arc of trying to move trying to convince folks that we need to acquire a couple of reporting businesses within this space, um, or at least one, sorry, not a couple. Um, and it started with maybe we first say we need a partnership around this. But it's like, you know, we shouldn't just have one partner. We should test a bunch of different partners. So maybe we have a marketplace around this. Um, you know, there's a bunch of docs ultimately, right? There was like a product vision doc. There was like a, how do I build this doc? So that's, you know, the product side driving this. How do we actually build this? What's the resourcing I need? Just going and getting funding. It's like, okay, well, I don't have funding for the reporting tools aspect of this product I envision. So I need, I need to tap some folks. And so when I was there anyway, that corporate function also uh, spent time on partnerships. And so that was, that was nice because uh, it allowed uh, me to go and kind of surface a bunch of partners and working with the product team and said, well, okay, since we have a bunch of partners and we don't think it's not clear to us, any one of these is going to make sense. 
why don't we build a marketplace like a really lightweight one? Okay, great. Uh, so what you know, uh, what is the benefit of marketplace? If we're right, then um, you know now we have built maybe a new revenue stream on the marketplace business here uh, for this specific product. And if we're wrong, it's lightweight. You know, it's just partners. We didn't have to build the reporting tools ourselves. Um, you know, like I, I think kind of having these like proof points and the story around those proof points, which kind of keeps evolving over time was really important. It wasn't like we started this story with, we would need to go buy a set of reporting tools to plug into this context center. It started with a context center product a story. Then it started with there's gaps here. We want to well, announce this at our next developer conference. So let's try, try a partner. Then it started with Corp Dev telling a story around yeah, one partner is probably not the right approach. You know, we don't know who's going to be the best in class. Like, let's start a marketplace. Um, then, you know, after we launched this marketplace at the developer conference, the question it turned out one of the partners was seeing, uh, you know, and you have to kind of keep changing your story based on the new information you have, you keep gathering. After we launched this, we learned that one of the partners had a disproportionate amount of traffic going to it, and you know, as part of going back to North Star, one of the companies North Stars was to have more software revenue, meaning revenue that was like higher gross margin than some of the core business. And so, uh, you know, the marketplace, we, we, this product was really high gross margin. So hit that company level in North Star. Um, we're seeing one partner disproportionately benefiting from it. So it doesn't really need to be a marketplace and speak one partner. But then we're giving away probably, I don't remember the exact percentage, we call it like a third of the economics to this one partner over time. Um, this is still all very nascent, right? At this point, it's not, not, not as if this partner is of any meaningful size here. But we're giving away a bunch of this. It's like, we should, we should go and tell an acquisition story. And so it started with, you know, kind of me flagging it in like a weekly pipeline update with one of our C-suite. It's like, okay, why don't you go and learn more? Then it was going with the product team and telling a story about how this is the one of the most critical components of this modular context center vision. Okay, great. So then why should we buy it? Well, okay, then kind of going with the finance team and trying to craft the story around uh, these are the numbers, like look at look at the over time, how we will enrich this other company to our you know detriment. Okay, great. And so now you combine all that into a story if you tell, uh, you know, and then that's it's no longer a really story. Now it's like a memo, it's analysis, right? But it's like the, all those like little portions, right? It started with a product doc, started with a marketplace story, started with, uh, and then went to, uh, um, uh, uh, what, you know, why, like a margin story, like uh, why it hits our North Star, some of one of our North Stars financially, and like our five year, that was like part of the five year vision, uh, and then you put it all together, um, and that you know that was over the course of another twelve to fifteen months um, that we thought put all this together, and it's like. What, you know, you're crafting a different story along the way based on new information and for the audience, right? The financial story was a little bit more toward the CFO, CEO. The product story was, you know, more toward um, like the C CPO. And so, um, you know, recognizing your audience, kind of the moment in time, what you can get done, like going your, you know, the shiny object syndrome piece. It sometimes it also applies when it's not a shiny object. Like, what can you actually get done? Like, what's interesting to this person in that moment? Like, what does your audience care about? And then finally, you know, like as it as you start winning all you know, doing all these proof points and these little wins, you can then package together the cohesive story and have that you know that big M and A meeting we always think about in the boardroom. Uh, but you know, it's actually a bunch of little conversations that get you there. And hopefully, it's not always the case. But hopefully, by the time you're in that boardroom, whether it's virtual or in real life, um, it's all kind of choreographed. It's all it's all like this. Who's everybody's been brought along for the story. story. Who's the what? hero? Is it the product manager that sort of painted this yeah. view or found this gap, or is it the customer? Who's the hero? Yeah, look, I think I think the product. I mean, it probably varies depending on the culture. Um, Twilio was a very customer centric place and still continues to be a very customer centric business. Um, so you know, there's a lot of customers to thank for advice there along the way and providing testimonies about why, you know, why Twilio would be a great place to, you know, buy these solutions from. Um, but ultimately, yeah, the product manager, right? The product manager is the one that kind of stuff, comes up with the initial vision. Um, and I would also say it's almost never going to be Corp Dev. Corp Dev doesn't take vows. I've, um, that's not my phrase. It's uh, somebody else in the Corp Dev world has said that to me before. And I totally believe that, you know, there's no end zone dance. Um, you still want to celebrate the team. You still want to have some celebration. Obviously, you work really hard. It's a milestone. It's better in the cap. But Corp Dev's not taking vows, you know, ultimately um, and partially in Corp Dev also is not super accountable for after the fact, right? The product person is going to be accountable for that. 
um, that that specific instance turned out to be a great acquisition, but um, doesn't always work out that way. So if it doesn't work out, you know, there's going to be a product person who also is going to receive a lot of blame. So I, I, yeah, that's probably the hero. And most of the time, I would imagine either the GM or the product lead. How do you deal with rejection handling? What are some tips on that? <laughs> you told uh, your story and you got to know or, uh, you know, yeah. this is why we shouldn't do the deal. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is completely true, but I, I, get, I feel like corporate professionals are pretty good at handling rejection. I, you know, it's just like, there's so many, it's a game of numbers in some way, right? Like, I don't think about it that way day to day. Each deal is its own deal. Each opportunity is an opportunity. If you don't get super excited about each one when you wake up, then it's like, or if, when, when you deal with it, then um, you're not going to be excited to get out of bed every day. But at the same time, yeah, like if you look at, you know, our, if you look at your funnel, like your pipeline, right, of where deals are, how many deals are in the top level and how many deals you've passed on, it's, there's, you know, a lot of no's there. So like, I, I think um, we don't, I feel like, you know, you don't take it too personally. People have thick skin moving on from rejection. I think, you know, maybe your question is more about when you have really high conviction, when you feel really good, like this is the deal, you know, like it doesn't happen often, but when you feel like this is the one, this is the one that's gonna, you know, hit all these like five objectives and move the catapult the business forward. Uh, knowing those situations stings, of course, but, um, you know, uh, I think it goes back to something I said earlier. It's like, who's saying no? Uh, is there an opportunity to convince? Um, I think working with executives over time, you learn when, you know, when there really isn't an opportunity to convince and, you know, you can take some more cuts at it, but it might just be wasted energy and probably just lead to more frustration rather just like fail fast and move forward. Um, but when you know it's an executive that can be convinced, right? Like that, you, you need to determine why the no is coming. Um, you need to do that work, uh, right? So is it, is it, I'm not ready now? You know, this is something where I have a bunch of other things I care about. And so maybe a year from now, is it, I don't believe in the market. You haven't convinced me, go do more work. I don't believe it's this target. I do love the market. And I'm, if I don't acquire into it, I'm definitely going to invest and build into it. Um, I just, this isn't the company that the CEO was, I didn't like the culture of the company, uh, CEO isn't the, somebody I feel like I can trust. Um, I, I'm more enamored with this other shiny object here. So until you tell me that that one doesn't make sense and you explain to me why it doesn't make sense, I can't even like be receptive to this new idea. Um, you know, trying to figure out like why the no is coming. Is it, is it, you know, is it even like, I just, you know, ultimately I have in my mind a framework. Like I am going to allocate capital in a different place because, um, you know, resources are finite. You know, you don't, you don't have endless capital to allocate. Um, I want to go deploy my M&A energy somewhere else. Like these things seem like they're obvious. You should have like a chart somewhere that's like, like linearly like plots out for you what, what you should be spending your time on. But it's, it's not often how I found executives work, right? Uh, there's all these competing priorities and it's not always clear like how to triage them. And these conversations you have to, I think, recognize are good opportunities to help you refine and calibrate what is going to be uh, the more successful conversation down the line. So, you know, you t use an opportunity to calibrate. Um, if you do think there's room to convince, you figure out in that meeting, because otherwise you're not going to get that kind of audience again, like why it's no, like if you can. Um, and then see if there's reason, if there are really convincing things to overcome the no, and not just like incremental things. That's never going to work. Like something really like, oh, we should have highlighted you know, this strength of the company, we didn't because we didn't know the CEO cared about it or the, you know, C-suite cared about it. Like go back and see if there are like some really big things that you kind of didn't highlight in the right way uh, and bring them back. But otherwise, you know, if, if they're not somebody you're going to be able to convince, if the no is based on way too many factors, um, then, you know, cut your, cut your losses and move on. And if, if it's like, if it wasn't a no based on trust issues, you know, then maybe it's something you revisit down the line. And that happens all the time. You, you revisit the same companies many times over because um, you know you change, people change, uh, companies change, uh, strategies evolve. So uh, it could, the timing may just not make sense. You should teach a class on this, how to get deals done. If you get the time, you know, we have our whole academy program. I was gonna say, isn't that what I'm doing right now, kind of? <laughs> we, we, we gotta just whiteboard it out and you know, turn it into some slide decks and stuff and pretty much then we'll edit it in micro learning format. But Let's before we wrap things up, Roy, what's the craziest thing you've seen in M&A? <laughs> uh, 
That, that's a good sign to ask the right person. That question. <laughs> I've seen a lot of crazy keys on. Um, but what could I share? Uh, that would be helpful. Um, Not incriminating. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I think the craziest conversation, I mean, this is going to be a generic one, but we can talk offline about some of the craziest things if you want at some point. But I think some of the more, uh, the funniest conversations often, like the funniest situations I think often happen when you need somebody to physically, like this kind of old school, but you, you need somebody either physically sign something or you know, like, or even electronically sign something like, you know, definitive docs to get the deal to close. And like somebody's, I don't know, uh, off in a different country vacationing or, you know, just like their phone is dead for like two days. And like, there's just this built up pressure, right? In these situations where you feel like you need to sign, like everybody's been working on this deal for six months. You promise it's gonna be this timeline. If you don't sign, your day one's gonna be totally off. All the systems cutovers are planned for this moment. And you just can't find this one executive. And it's thinking whether it's the CFO or CEO. And it's, it is insane because the thing they're doing is probably so trivial. They're making, you know, they're making, their phone's off, their phone's been dead, and they're making breakfast for their kids. Or, you know, they're off surfing somewhere. <laughs> and uh, it is, or I don't know, maybe it's a religious observation, which isn't as crazy, but like, why can we have planned around that? We didn't know, like, they can't, they literally can't sign something for two days. So like, there's these mo these moments, I mean, I think, and this is something probably relatable to all deal professionals, I've seen it a little more acutely in certain of my roles, um, that, you know, when you promised all these timelines, you're trying to get something signed. And just the most trivial thing is like keeping it up from signing because this person is just, you know, prioritize something else. And hey, I, I think that's great. That's that's work life balance when it's like, you know, we have a hundred people on both sides, like bated breath, waiting to close this thing. And you're waiting to collect this one signature on a page. And they've already, you know, pre approved it, but you still need to get the signature. So I think a lot of, um, Anyway, over over beers, but like I think a lot of the uh, the, the crazy moments yeah. in my my deal processes have hinged on on that situation. I feel like every deal has that the last minute things that pop up. This has been a Absolutely. good conversation. I kept writing all these topics. I didn't get a hit on everything I wanted to. I wanted to ask you what it's like working with Jack and all these other things. So maybe we got to follow on. I uh, sounds great. Thanks so much, though. Spend the time and tell everybody else.